Okay, so let's let's um, get started. Um, now, as Greg said, you know, he, uh, although our goal is not to take every case to trial, but the fact of the matter is, is that occasionally that's the uh, most expeditious, sometimes the only way to resolve the dispute. So, but bef before you get there, there are certain uh, pretrial general considerations, um, which, uh, you know, you need to take into consideration, and there's no one better to discuss that than uh, our friend Chris Melcher. Now, Chris is a partner in the family law firm of um, Walzer and Melcher in Woodland Hills, and he specializes uh, in complex high asset cases, a well-known expert on premarital agreement, and I'm not sure. Oh, by the way, uh, Chris, did you hear that about um, Garrett being the great appellate lawyer? Did, uh, <laughs> um, Chris is also an outstanding uh, uh, appellate lawyer, and he and I have um, faced each other or, and worked with each other in many cases. And I can tell you that he is absolutely uh, outstanding. Uh, he's not only a certified family law specialist, he's a fellow um, former chair of the uh, California State Bar Section and a member of Flexcom. I could go on and on, Chris, but instead, I think they'd rather hear from you. Well, thanks, Garrett. Um, and I really appreciate everyone joining us uh, on this webinar and just looking through the list of attendees. I'm seeing folks that I know uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with. And I'm seeing also some people who've been around for a while and done this um, and know how to do a trial. And that's so important because this is a perishable skill. We never stop learning these things. And um, it's only through doing trial after trial that we really become uh, with second nature. And, but it's perishable. If we don't constantly renew these skills, we lose these skills. So for all uh, watching this, uh, we're going to get a lot out of it. And we're going to talk eight hours about trial prep and how to conduct a trial. And it would really take you eight weeks to implement all this stuff. It's a tremendous amount of information that we're going to be giving and that we're responsible for knowing when we're putting on a trial. My view, trials are won and lost before you walk into the courtroom. And it's through preparation. It's not you going up there showboating and, and doing your stuff. It's what you did quietly beforehand. And so we're going to spend time in, in my little segment here talking about what that looks like. And we have some slides you can, you can look at, um, but I'm going to be starting around si slide three here. And um, so first of all, what is a trial? And to me, I always wanted to be a trial lawyer. My dad was a great trial lawyer and I wanted to be just like him. I watched trials. I watched this OJ Simpson trial on court TV and it was captivating. And when done right, it's theater. And we are the ones that are directing it. We're writing it. We're not uh, making up the facts. So this isn't uh, um, totally drama. Um, but it's more of a, a, a real story that we're telling, but we are writing the script. We're deciding the presentation, the order of the story. And we have to keep in mind we are telling a story. And that's what's compelling to people. That's, that's ingrained in us. I read my son a story last night going to bed, and I was read stories. We were all read stories. That is the way we best intake information and judges are people too. And they like a good bedtime story. They don't want to be shouted at. They don't want to be told how to think. They want to hear something compelling and then make their own observations from that. And a story method is the best way to present all these facts. Because in our case, and especially in family law, we have all kinds of issues. We have custody and financial we have a many, many different facts and many documents, and it's your choice on how to present those. What order are you going to do that? Are you going to start chronologically, beginning, middle, and end? Or are you going to start at the end and work backwards? You can decide how to do that. And so I would invite you to start looking at um, great storytellers. And there's so much stuff on YouTube and the internet about how to tell a story 
from screenwriters, from people who are doing this for movies. So I would take a look at that when you're coming up with themes in your case and how to present your case, look at how the best of the best do it, and then come up with a strategy about how you're going to put all this together. Now, um, what we have to know is the facts. To me, it's all about the facts. And as I've been learning appeals, following after greats like Garrett, um, in the appellate process, to me, it's all about the facts. It's all about this big old statement of facts. And when I get done writing that statement of facts, the reader, the appellate justice, should know already how to rule. And the law is just a detail. They hopefully already know that, but they don't know the facts. Only you can tell those. And so we need to master those. We need to know every intricate detail of those. And every fact, for the most part, is neutral. We can put a spin on almost any fact, even ones that look really bad. We can turn around and say, well, of course, my client was angry. Of course, my client yelled. That wasn't an act of abuse. That wasn't a bad parent. My client was triggered. And let me tell you what happened before my client lost his cool. You can take that bad fact and turn it around and tell a story about it. So don't be scared of the facts. Most of these things are neutral. We also have to know the law really, really well. And because the judge may not know the law too good, um, may have come from a different assignment. And looking at you as the family lawyer to provide that education on what the law is. And if we don't know what we're talking about, we have no credibility. And if we have no credibility, our client is not served. So master the facts, know the law inside and out, and then be truthful about these things. Because we are spokespeople. Um, we are guides. We are trusted. We're officers of the court. And if you lose your credibility, on one thing, you lose your credibility on everything, not just that one case, every case. And um, we get paid a lot of money to do what we do, but I don't get paid enough money to lie. At least I haven't been paid that much yet. So, because it's gonna burn my ability to help other clients. So be aware of what you're spending. Don't spend your credibility. Now exhibits, um, I love this topic because Documents don't lie or mostly don't lie. Anytime people are talking, they're probably lying, but documents are fixed. And we have that's why lawyers love documents so much because we can analyze this thing. We know what it says. If it's authentic, you know, genuine document, it's there and we know we can build a case around it. So we want to use these things, but how do you use them? Well, they're going to have to be marked as exhibits. Now, what we want to do with opposing counsel is meet and confer with them about numbering in particular. And I've seen so many times people show up at a trial, the convention is the petitioner uses numbers and the respondent uses letters. And here I'm seeing a respondent with exhibit one. And I have exhibit one, now we're screwed up. Or the respondent uses the convention and has exhibit ZZZZ, which is literally going to put us to sleep if we're saying that many letters. So get on the same page. Um, even if we're not getting along too well, we can figure that one out. And I usually I'll say, I'll take from one to 999 and you can take 1000 forward. I may only have 50 exhibits, but we can agree you'll start at exhibit 1000. We also want to talk about it admissibility. It's going to make our trial prep a lot easier if we don't have to bring in custodian or records or bank statements, or maybe we have to do that. There's going to be a question. Do you group these exhibits or mark them individually? For example, you might have exhibit one, text messages between the parties, and then just have the running text messages. Or you might have exhibit one, text message of today, text message of yesterday. Now, um, I like the grouping because that allows me to get my exhibit list out quickly and then figure out exactly what that exhibit looks like when I actually have to produce it. Also, we have these rule of completeness. So if it's text and emails, 
if we take one email or text out of context, we may not be able to get it in. So I like the big running thing and say, client, give me the whole text message download. That's exhibit one. And then I can just say, hey, court, I want you to go to page 500 of exhibit one. And you can see it there. And if anybody says, hey, context, we can go look at the whole thing if you want. Or something might come up during trial that I never imagined. Some new invented claim, which often does happen. Well, I can say, hey, let's check the text messages. What was said, if anything, about this new issue that we're hearing about? Boom, exhibit one. Let's take a look. Do we mark depot transcripts? Well, you don't have to. You can lodge those. But I mark them as exhibits because now it's in my exhibit binder, which I keep electronically, which we're going to talk about, but I want them all in one place. I don't want to be fumbling around and saying, Judge, well, I gave it to your clerk and this and that, and they're never going to find it. No, go to exhibit 33. That's the depot. Impeachment exhibits. Before, when we were all in person, we'd have the folder and we would there have it there and ready to go. But now if we're doing video depots, we're doing video court appearances, it is really, really hard to use an impeachment exhibit. We're going to say, oh, well, I have this new exhibit. I've emailed it to counsel. Counsel, can you send it to the client? Oh, I never got your email. And the other party doesn't see it. I don't know what you're talking about. And now all of the surprise element is gone. So what I've been doing is just going ahead and marking those things and hoping that they don't see them. Um, because I need to have them exchanged. I need to have them done electronically, ready for the court, ready for the opposing party to go, rather than fumbling around for a half hour to do it. Have the client review the exhibit list. Super important. This is their money, their life, their case. And if you're building this whole trial upon your 50 exhibits, and now we're here and they're saying, well, where is this other, where is this document? Where is this key document? Oh, I don't know. Have them review your exhibit list. Is there anything missing, client? And then have your cheat sheet. Your exhibit list is not going to just say the number and the identification or description of it. You're going to say, was this identified? Was this admitted? And every time the document is identified, Your Honor, I'm marking or showing you what's previously marked as exhibit one. Stop, check on the checklist. And I put the date because a lot of these trials go on for a long time. Hey, it's whatever, May 14th. I ID that. The second I'm done talking about it, you're, if I'm wanting to move it into evidence, Your Honor, move it into evidence. Get that done right there. And if it's admitted, check, check that. That's going to be gold to you. Don't let that list go because that's going to be super helpful throughout the trial and at the end. Don't wait to offer the exhibits into evidence because... Um, there may be a foundational objection you can't address when that witness is no longer on the stand. Mark the exhibits, super important. How many lawyers, such a sloppy practice, they don't mark the exhibits. Drives me absolutely insane. So they got all these exhibits, spent all this money preparing for a trial, key documents, there's no marking on the bottom of it all. What's exhibit one, what's exhibit two? They're not paginated. So now we're fumbling through and they're saying, well, you know, this whole the bank statements, if you go, Your Honor, about a third way through. No, we got to be acting quickly. Exhibit one, page 23, line three. Boom. That shows we're in command, shows we're being efficient. If we're fumbling around, we look like idiots. And most of life and particularly trials is about perception. So we never want to look like an idiot. I do everything electronically. Everything. And so I don't have any paper if I can avoid it. And so I'm putting all of these key documents in a folder on my server. I have an exhibit folder and I just start, hey, this is exhibit one, exhibit two, exhibit three. And then I will then put all that together in Adobe. I can use that to mark. I can use that to redact. I can put the whole package together and then I can send that electronically to the client, to the experts, opposing counsel, to the court, to the court clerk. And I also show up with iPads. And so all of this stuff is on an iPad, loaded up, ready to go. Uh, I use this application called TrialPad, which is just helps the iPad um, use like a traditional file format structure that we're used to seeing. Takes two seconds to show the witness. Here's how to use it. Everyone gets an iPad.
This is actually cheaper than doing it on paper. If you have a big old trial and you have the bunch of four inch binders, how many people need to get these? The court, the court clerk, the opposing counsel, one for the witness, one for you, one for the other side. You're talking four, five, six sets of how many binders? Who's going to do all that work? Are you going to farm it out? You're going to have the staff do it. Each binder, each set of that, you could buy an iPad for it. I have 12 iPads sitting here in, in a case, all charged up, ready to go. We load them up and I deal them out like a deck of cards during the trial. You know, Chris, you used to have 13, but I kept one as a souvenir after our last trial. Um, oh. You know, let me just throw in an observation here. And that is, I've listened to Chris talk about his iPads uh, for a number of years, but you know, I, I'm, I'm a four inch binder kind of guy, at least I was until we had a pretty good sized trial down in San Jose together. And um, next thing you know, I'm saying to Chris, can I borrow your iPad for the night? Um, because it was so, I, you know, I gotta tell you that blew me away. It was so handy, it was so easy, so efficient. Um, can you wrap up in, a, in, a, in about one minute, Chris, do you think? Yeah, sure. And and Garrett beat me for the record, beat me badly on that trial, despite having all no, the iPads. Uh, look, justice was done. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you schooled you, me. That's the difference. See, the result may have been one, but I'm the one who got who learned something. So thank you for that. Well, and, and just that final comment on that, and, and you can see, because I'm based in Los Angeles, I'm handling a case in San Jose, Garrett's based in Oakland, going up to a case in San Jose, you're going to be doing that too. I showed up at that trial with a backpack for a one week trial and a couple changes of clothes and a suitcase. If I was doing it old school, I would have had carts and all this kind of stuff. So make it, make it easier on yourself. Okay, that's what I have to say. It, let me let me throw in one comment, um, uh, uh, Chris, and I, I'd be interested to know if you agree with me on this. You know, when I'm trying a case, in general, I would much rather try a case against a highly experienced lawyer than a young lawyer. And the reason is not what you would necessarily think. The reason is more that the young lawyer scares me more than the old lawyer does, because I don't know about, you know, uh, most older lawyers say, ah, it's just an RFO for support, you know, and in they go. Whereas somebody who hasn't done it is going to spend hours preparing to make sure that they get it right. And in my experience, um, the better prepared lawyer is going to win. Uh, not the one who's necessarily done it a hundred times or a thousand times, it's the one who's better prepared. And so I really, you know, I, I really worry about facing the young lawyers who've spent 10 hours preparing for that 20 minute RFO. Um, and I, I think there's a, a message there. Anyway, we'll be back to you shortly, Chris. Uh, thank you uh, very much. All right. Well, Chris did so well before. Let's um, uh, let's bring him back for an encore. And and you know, Chris, um, I think opening statements are in 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 virtually all cases are are just hugely important. And rarely do I see them uh, uh, done. Most people just think that their trial brief is is sufficient. I remember one judge telling me one time sitting, he says, you know, it's routine for me. I'll be sitting on the bench for five, 10, 15 minutes in the RFO calendar. And then I'll finally look down and say to somebody, um, would somebody like to tell me what this, what the, what the requests are? You know, you know, what are the issues here? And they're, everybody's throwing the evidence in, in front of the court and, and nobody's sought to ask, you know, tell the judge what the issues are. So how do you deal with that? How do you get the judge ready to, um, to um, uh, you know, listen to the evidence and a rule in your favor? This is something I've struggled with because when, when I started, I was doing jury trials and criminal and those are uh, much more, you know, procedurally strict and you definitely have an opening and you have the trier of fact as the jury in the box haven't heard a whole lot about the case other than through uh, voir dire. So uh, when I transitioned into family law, I'm getting ready to do my, my great opening. And I'm usually getting shut down by the judge saying, look, I've, I've read your trial brief. 
and we've had multiple hearings on the case. I understand exactly what's going on and put on your witness. And many times that's what's happened. Or I'll start with my my opening and and then uh, they'll interrupt me and say, hey, you know, OK, we, I, I kind of get it. Move on. You know, maybe I'm just not too good at doing openings, but I think that the court, um, if it's familiar with the case, which it probably is through pretrial conferences and through trial briefs, doesn't want to hear information that it hasn't already heard. So we do have to keep in mind it's not a jury trial. This is a bench trial. And so my openings are tailored for that. And I'm more trying to come in it as a time management um, thing, because that's what the court's mostly concerned about and saying, you know, your honor, the evidence is going to show this through these witnesses. I am going to present these documents. I'm going to call these witnesses. This is what they're going to say. This is what I'm going to prove to you. And that way I am indoctrinating them about what I think my case is about or what I want them to take away from it. But I'm also letting them know, hey, these are the witnesses. This is the time estimate. This is what you're going to get from these witnesses. These are what you're going to get from these documents. They tend to be a little bit more likely to listen in that. My point of this is you got to be ready for your opening, but you also have to be ready not to give it if the court doesn't want to hear it. The, the, you, you can't force feed this stuff. And if a judge is saying, I don't want to hear it, yes, your honor, thank you for that guidance. Move on. You know, the one, one thing to me, especially in a complex trial of the type that you do a lot of, you know, one of the problems is, is that, you know, the evidence comes in, 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 you know, bits and pieces, you know, a piece here, a piece there, you know, somewhere else. And then at the end, we try to tie it together and uh, make the court see how it interrelates. To me, the opening statement is the place where you show the court how all of these pieces are going to fit together. You show the court, just like with a jury, you know, which you've done, I've never uh, um, done to a jury, but you, you promise the jury you're going to produce certain evidence. And this is where you're able to show that it all, how it's going to fit in. Of course, the downside to that is after you make the promise, you better, you better deliver. Um, Anyway, yeah, that, that's the problem. I think, uh, you know, some of us aren't too sure how it's all going to come out. So maybe we don't want to give that opening. Um, Justice Sonenshine had said um, in, in an, another version of this presentation about don't um, over promise and under deliver. And I always take that to heart because that's what the judges are looking at. I've definitely, if some of the other side's doing an opening, I want a transcript of that. And I'm going to call them out on that in my closing. Remember, Your Honor, when we started this trial, you were promised this was going to be said. This is what was going to be proven. We all know that didn't happen. So it can be used against you. It can be used against the other side. Um, basically, it does help with evidentiary rulings a whole lot if the court isn't familiar with the case. And sometimes in, in, in some counties, when we have these longer trials, you do get shipped off to a, a judicial officer who's never heard about your case until that morning. And there is the opening statement going to be very helpful because they may have only skimmed your trial brief. And so when we're going through evidentiary objections during the trial itself, the opening statement is going to help them understand, oh, OK, this is why you really want this document in or this is really why you want this testimony to tell that story that you uh, told me about in opening. So it definitely can help. Um, also, we can be talking about the legal standard because the court may be a little weak on that and saying, hey, this is a premarital agreement. This is the standard for determining uh, the validity of a premarital agreement. This is the defenses here. And so that could be helpful for the court to hear that. Most advocates, though, launch into their closing within probably two or three minutes of an opening. And that's not the purpose of it. Um, it is to tell the court what you were promising to prove, not what you think actually happened. So we have to be careful not to go into argument. That's where you're definitely going to get shut down. What I've learned is, is to write the judgment in advance, the judgment that you want, or if it's a hearing, the order that you want. I write that up front because what happens is, is that, uh, and I learned this through one of the cases that I tried, is that uh, at the end, I, I, I was tasked with writing this judgment, 
And I realized I left some stuff out. They were minor details, but they were no one testified to it. So now I write the judgment up in advance. This is who I want the dog awarded to. This is what I'm doing with this life insurance policy. Small stuff that maybe you don't remember to do, but now that I've done it in advance, I have it in my list. So when I'm doing my witness outlines, I am making sure that I'm getting testimony about that or I'm getting documents in about that. Because at the end, if the judge says, hey, write up the judgment, great. You can't just sneak stuff in when there's no evidence to support it. There has to be a record for it. So uh, that's why I do that. And then to Garrett, to your point, tell the judge what you want. There was one judge that I did a program with years ago and we were talking about court forms. And this was uh, when we were redesigning court forms uh, statewide for family law. And then in his, he said, I only want two questions on any court form. What do you want and why do you want it? He says, every form should have those two questions. But what do we see in these pleadings that we get from opposing parties, counsel? It's everything about how awful we are and our client are. But at the end, it's like, what, okay, what do you want? I get it. You hate me, but what do you want? Nobody ever asked for that. So up front, what is it you want? That then provides context to the judge to say, oh, okay, you want this order. You want this much support, whatever, this house. Fine. Now I understand what you want. It helps me give context. Now, I want to talk about something that nobody ever talks about, something that is important, uh, more important, I think, than anything else I'm going to say, which is preparing yourself, because all this other talk we're hearing is preparing your case, but nobody talks about preparing yourself for trial. And here's how it normally works. People, uh, attorneys, we're perfectionists. We want to do a perfect job for our clients. That's all admirable. So what do we do over prepare? Since we over prepared, we don't sleep. We spend up all night before getting ready for our trial. Now we're a wreck in that morning. We're going to court or office, wherever we're doing these trials. Now we're running late. We're totally stressed. We can't find parking. We got all of our exhibits here. If we're doing it on paper, perfectly prepared. We're rolling it across the street. A little cart spills over in the crosswalk, and now we're, it's all over the street, and we're running into court late, frazzled. We've already lost that case, or at least we've lost control of ourselves before we've even said anything. And um, so, and then we go into primal freeze mode, which I see lawyers doing. Now they're not objecting, saying anything, because they're just totally shut down or they go into flight, they run to the bathroom. You don't wanna do that. And I've learned through doing successive trials to disengage and let go. And the more that I disengage, the more in a flow state with athletes say I'm in. It. So here's what I suggest. If I had a trial on Monday and here it is Friday, I would prepare all day today. Might even stay a little bit late in the office preparing. But Saturday and Sunday, I'm not even going to think about the case, refuse to think about it going to have fun. I'm going to mountain bike, cook, do whatever I like to do. Get a great night's sleep Sunday, wake up early, have a really nice breakfast. I'm going to take an Uber down to the court. Might look at some stuff in the car in the back. I'm going to pay the guy 20 bucks to bring my bags and stuff in for me. If there's a coffee shop by, I'm going to get a huge cappuccino. And I'll walk in totally relaxed. I know the case because I've been preparing it for maybe a year. I don't need to, to jam all this in the last time. I need to prepare myself. And when I've been doing this, and it freaks out people in my office that I work with um, because they're like, why aren't you stressed? And it stresses them out. But when I come in like that, um, I am in a state of mind that I'm ready now to adapt. Yes, exactly. We have to get into that Zen state. And it's super important. Um, don't overlook that. Um, you have to take care of yourself because if you're just think about your client, the person that's hired you and hopefully is paying you and their life is on the line, all about you and you're coming in frazzled and they're trying to calm you down. No, you need to be the reassuring strong force. Otherwise, the client's going to freak out on you. And then also the court needs to see you as somebody who's enlightened, who's centered, balanced, ready to go. And it's going to also the other side will see that in you as well. And now all of a sudden, everyone's looking at you. So that's super, super important. I can't underestimate that. Do all your prep up in advance. 
don't pull all nighters, don't stress out, you're just hurting yourself, have confidence, you know the case. And the other thing is, these lawyers here, perfectionists, that is not a way to go. And no human can be perfect. We're all imperfect. So my goal is not to be perfect, it's to be good enough. It's for the court to hear my story. And that's an achievable goal. So I, I encourage you to think about this stuff. It's allowed me to enjoy what I'm doing after all these years. I still love doing it because I'm not freaking myself out by it. You have a long, long career to go and give yourself the space to do it right. Garrett, uh, I know when we tried that case, we're, we're both from out of towners and we're coming into San Jose. Uh, you were, you're pretty calm too. So I assume you, you uh, practice the same kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, it's, you know, it is so important to appear to the court to be, you know, in control and, you know, not only of the facts and the law, but, but of yourself, you know, you, you, you never ever want to um, give the appearance of, you know, of panicking, of being surprised, uh, et cetera. And the best way to do that, of course, is to be prepared. Like I said uh, earlier, um, you know, is that the better prepared attorney usually will get the better result. I mean, the facts and law may have something, a little something to do with it, but good lawyering um, really, really makes the difference, in, in my opinion. The better prepared lawyer wins. I know when I was a young lawyer, I used to get really good results against older lawyers, and it was simply because I was so terrified that I, you know, would, you know, I would be ultra, ultra uh, prepared. But you know, the the, the image of the uh, guy crossing the crosswalk and having the um, the the box fall off, I'm sitting there thinking, oh God, you <laughs> know, remembering the days. So you know, your points are all well taken, Chris, as they always are. Well, and it happens, and and when we tried that case, um, you had an audio visual problem. You couldn't get for some reason your laptop wasn't working, and you couldn't get your PowerPoint working. And this is what happens oh, yeah. every trial. Basically, you you have it all planned and orchestrated. Everything's going on, but within minutes, the wheels come off. There's something that's going to happen. The judge isn't there, or is late, or a witness doesn't show up. Your client's not there whatever the judge saying, I want to take stuff out of order. I've got totally different views on your case. And now it's all out the window and you have to adapt to that. And that's where I say about that flow state that where athletes will talk about getting into because they're totally prepared, but they're also ready to adapt and deal with the situation on the ground. And that's what we have to do. We have to expect that problems are going to happen. And if we are not mentally, physically healthy, prepared in that way, we are not going to be able to adapt to that. Well, there's an old adage that says no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. You know, and and that's that's true. One of the things they teach you in law school about doing live demonstrations in front of a jury or a judge is that you know they they seldom go well. <laughs> you know, you know you've got to be very very careful, and we'll be talking a little bit more uh, about that um, in a minute. All right, let's, uh, Chris. Thank you very much. 